And you may be seated. Thank you all. First of all, thank you all very much for coming and being a part of Pueblo's Church this afternoon. We're going to be in several portions of Scripture, so I'm going to, I'm going to prep you right now. We're going to start off in Genesis chapter 4, and we're going to be in Genesis chapter 4, and then Job 42, not Job 42, but Job 42. And um, Job is actually the book right before Psalms. And then we're going to go to 1 Timothy chapter 6, and in Proverbs chapter 3 is where we're going to finish. And while you're making your way to Genesis 4, maybe even Gen uh, Job 42, I want to take a quick moment to send a quick shout out to everyone that's listening to us live or joining us live through Radio Alleluia, Alleluia TV, through social media. God bless you. We hope that if you find yourself in the Houston area, that soon, very soon, you'll be able to come and live the experience with us here at Pueblo's Church. God bless you, and thank you for joining us. Um, I've uh, spent a few weeks teaching teaching on marriage, teaching on family. Today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch gears. We're going to embark in a new uh, series of teachings. Um, they say that at the table, there are three topics you shouldn't talk about at the table when you're eating with the family or with friends. One is politics, right? Two is money. Three, if you don't know, you can ask me after church and, and I, I might tell you. Um, and well, today we're going to talk about one of those topics and we're going to talk about money. And uh, we're going to just uh, live this life that, hey, it's not my money, but it's God's money. And I'm going to do my best to lay a foundation, a good foundation on how we should view money, how we should relate to money, how we should deal with money. Um, a few uh, months ago, I believe, I was teaching and in the teaching, I don't know how or what, I don't remember what I was teaching about, but I mentioned that many of us have a bad relationship with food. Right? Uh, so, uh, who, here, who here, like Pastor Ruben, eats junk food? Anybody here eat junk food? Y'all lying if you didn't raise your hand. You lying. First of all, we, we need to start there. Let's talk about lying. No, I'm just kidding, right? Now, you know, we, what is one of the terms for junk food? There's a term that people use other than junk food. What's another term? Comfort food right? Comfort food. You, you know, you're depressed, you eat a cho German chocolate cake, you're mad, you go in and, you know, get a double meat cheeseburger uh, from, from Whataburger. Um, my dad, uh, my mom would make empanadas and we would eat and everybody's full and we're leaving and my dad would turn around and grab one more empanada and he would say in Spanish, de puro coraje me voy a comer esta empanada. And then he would walk away laughing, right? Or he'd later come on and, and get a bowl of chips and be like, de puro coraje me voy a comer estos fritos. And walk away laughing, right? And, and so many people have a bad relationship with food. Well, let me tell you that many of us in the church, I dare say most of us in the church, we have a bad relationship with money. We don't really know how to deal with money. We don't really know how, how we should think of money, how, how God views money. And I want to share with you today a lesson, not based on my opinion, because if we were to ask if we were to ask here about money, we will, you know, I don't know, there's probably 200 people in, in the room right now. We'd have about 200 different opinions about money, right? So we don't want to go based on, on our opinion, on opinions, on I think, well, you know, I think. No, no, no. We want to know what does God say, right? What, what does God say? And we want to base our views based on God's word because uh, heaven, heaven and earth will pass, but God's word will remain right? Heaven and earth will pass, but God's word will remain. So I'm going to teach a bunch of different concepts. Um, toward the end, I'm going to share with you some questions that I hope you take a picture of because I want you to reflect over these questions. And then I'm going to share four truths about money. And then at the very, very, very end of service, like, I mean, like right before we leave, before we dismiss, I'm going to do my best over these next few weeks to share with you some, some sort of financial tip, all right? Because I, I, I want everybody here to be rich and prosperous. It's not the most important thing in life, but but I, I don't want you worrying about money, that's for sure, right? So the first thing I want you to learn today is that money is spiritual, right? Money is a spiritual matter, okay? So I'm gonna show you, right? There are people who don't come to church. There are people who they don't wanna have nothing to do with church. There are people that if, if in conversation, you bring up church some way, somehow, in some form about coming to church or something, the first thing that they will say is, oh man, church is all about money. Right? All they talk about that place is nothing but money. Right? Uh, they, they will be bothered, like, like that's, that's how they see church. Notice that they will not say, they will not say, oh, church, that's where you go to worship God. They won't say that. 
They will not say like, oh, church, that's where people's lives are being transformed. That's where marriages are being reconciled and, and edified. They won't say that. You know, Friday night, my wife and I, we were here with the youth. We had about 72, 73 youth from 6 to 12 graders here at the church. And you know what they were doing? They were all getting spray paint cans, getting ready to go throughout the city. They're going to go bend. No, they weren't doing that. We gave them all a bunch of buckets of rocks so they could go into the neighborhoods and, and break windows and laugh. Like, no, not our kids. You know what our, our, our teens were doing, what our junior high school and high school students were doing here at Pueblo's church, here at La Iglesia del Pueblo, on a Friday night, they weren't experimenting with sex, they weren't experimenting with drugs, they weren't experimenting with alcohol. No, they were here praising and worshiping the living God. They were here receiving the message of Jesus Christ. They were here living a transformed life. But you see, they don't talk about that. They just talk, oh, church, it's all about money. They don't, they don't talk about that. Our kids are law-abiding law citizens. They don't talk about the community impact that the church has. Now, let me tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing it even closer to home. Many of you, many of you in your life, you have friends or family members who have never bought you, they've never bought you a cup of coffee. I was uh, remembering at 8 a.m., that when I was a kid, and this shows that I'm getting old, <laughs> when I was a kid at Whataburger, they used to sell this brown cup. Right? They, at Whataburger, they used to sell this brown coffee cup. And if you had that brown coffee cup, a refill of coffee was a nickel. Anybody remember that? Right there. Sister Ortega doesn't let me lie. She had two of them. She's spending 10 cents. <laughs> 10 cents for coffee, getting two cups. Not making this up. But today, I, if I talk about a cup of coffee, all of y'all think about Starbucks. <laughs> so expensive, it's more than a gallon of gas. <laughs> all right. There are friends, family members, co-workers, associates, people you know that have never bought you a Starbucks. They will never buy you a taco, all right? But they'll never buy you a breakfast taco at Stripes. But... If they were to find out, if they were to know that you go to church and when you go to church, you give your tithes and on top of your tithes, you give an offering. And if you like Pastor Ruben and my family, we, we practice what we call first fruits. That means in a new season, a new era, we give a special offering or when we start something new, like a new job and we, or something, we give a first fruit offering. If they ever find out that you do that, you give that to the church, they will be mad. They will be bothered. They would, they would get all weird around you. They've never paid five cents for a refill at Whataburger. They've never bought you a, a latte with a splash of matcha in it from Starbucks. They've never um, bought you a breakfast taco at Stripes. But why, why? Who puts this in the mind of those people that are out there that are bothered because at church, people, we pick up offerings and tithes. Who puts it in the mind of your friends and family and coworkers to be bothered that you give your tithes and you're, oh, you're brainwashed and what have you. Who puts that, you think God puts that in their mind? I'm not answering you. Answer it. Think God puts that in the mind? Let's go to Genesis chapter 4, and I'm going to show you how spiritual money is. Genesis chapter 4 is the story of the first family and the first brothers, not, not brothers in, in the faith. I, I was reading a, a, a little um, carousel before I, I, I came into service, and, and it said, Church is weird. This is a pastor. He's writing this, and he's like, church, we can be weird. And he goes, and we use weird, weird um, terminologies like hallelujah and amen. Like for someone who doesn't know about church, they come in, and we're like, hallelujah. And they're like, what, what's wrong with that person? That's weird, right? And, and then he was like, one of the weird things we say is brother. I mean, well, I don't know. I, mean, I call people outside of church brother as well, so it's okay. But anyway, this is the first brothers, not brothers in, in la fe, not brothers at church, but brothers, like blood brothers, and you know the story of Cain and Abel, but let's read it. Let's go back. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. It says, now Adam had sexual relations. That was the third topic right there, if you didn't get it. Now Adam had sexual relations with his wife, Eve, and she became pregnant. And when she gave birth to Cain, she said, with the Lord's help, I have produced a man. Let's go to verse 2. Later, she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. 
And when they grew up, Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the land. Now, what, what does it mean that Cain cultivated the land? He was like, you know, Abel was kind of like a rancher and Cain was like a farmer, right? So he, Cain is like planting tomatoes and maize, corn, you know, cucumbers. We're in Pasadena. Strawberries, right? <laughs> Some of y'all get it. Some of y'all like, I don't get it. Strawberry festival. Anyways, verse three. You, you ought to read the history of the strawberry festival. Anyways, verse three. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Now, let me tell you. Well, let's read verse four. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. And this made Cain very angry and he looked dejected. Let's go back to verse three. Now, I don't know why there's a, there's a lot of pastors, preachers smarter than me, theologians smarter than me, that they have all these reasons and theories on why God accepted Abel's offering but rejected Cain. But I want to tell you, at the end of the day, this is money. Uh, for instance, does anybody here, does anybody here like um, sow, like, you know, like, like you plant? To, I asked in some of the other services. So some, these are some of the things that your brothers and sisters at La Iglesia Pueblo are planting. Someone said corn. I mean, she must have a little farm or something, right? Or big backyard. Chile, <laughs> chiles, right? Uh, my mom has chile de monte, chile pequin all over the house. Uh, someone else said tomatoes, right? Anybody here plant is that type of stuff? Any produce? What do you plant? Watermelon, you, you, you do live out there, right? In the country, okay, watermelon. What else? Were you gonna say something else other than watermelon? What? Peppers and strawberries, watermelon, peppers, strawberries. Anybody else? I saw a hand over there. Some, come on, don't be embarrassed. But hermana, what do you, what do you, what do you so? Tomatoes, hermanas, the tomatoes para el pico de gallo, right? You're like that, she's like, oh, fresh, fresh, fresh. <laughs> what do you, what do you plant? I don't know you plant it, what do you, huh? Limes, hey, my mom, man, she, has, she used to have a bunch of um, uh, grapefruit trees in, in the backyard. And, I mean, so much, like we couldn't eat them. Like, I mean, they're there, like we, she'd bring them to the church and give them away at the radio. Okay, so let's say that this year you, you planted, you planted tomatoes, strawberries, uh, watermelon, uh, put some more lime trees, put some more grapefruit trees, and it's so much, so much that you gave it to your friends. Your friends are like, no, 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 we're cool, we're cool. You gave us enough, and you still have some left over, so you're like, you know what, let's put them in buckets, and let's, let's go put a, stand in a little corner somewhere, and we're going to sell it. And all of a sudden, that harvest becomes what in your hand? Money. Right? Because money, right? So we're reading harvest and we're reading about, um, you know, these, these lambs. But at the end of the day, they represent, what do they represent? Money. Okay, help me out here. This, we're reading about this crop, this harvest, and we're reading about these lambs and this flock. At the end of the day, they represent what? Money. They represent money. Are, are we in agreement with that? Or, or am I making something up that you're lost on? Okay, no, okay. Now notice, uh, I'm going to take you to eighth grade English class. Oh, no, pastor. Come on up. All right. What's an adjective? An adjective describes something, right? It's like colors. It's like numbers. Notice that there's no adjectives on Cain's gift. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. That's, that's the adjective, some. He gave, he gave God something. Offering, back, offering buckets passing by him. Get that dollar. Just throw it in there. Give him something. Right? Now notice with verse 4, with Abel, it says, Abel also brought a gift. Now notice the adjectives. Best portions. Firstborn. All right. Okay, here's a concept to learn when you're giving your tithes, you're giving your offering, you're giving it. Here's a concept to learn and live by. Give God what is first and what is best. Right? Always give God what is first and what is best. You'll never lose. Right? Give God what is first and what is best. God sees that, hey, he brought, he brought the best. He brought what was first. He brought what was best. Now, let me tell you why the firstborn or the first fruits, or as we say in Spanish, primicias, are so important. Because when we give the firstborn, the first fruits, the primicias, God actually, around the with Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, God tells his people, firstborn, even your firstborn son belongs to me. That's what God tells his people. What's the deal with the firstborn or the first fruits? Like, we're coming back to Texas now, all right? Here in Texas, we have cattle, we have cows and bulls, all right? And 
so you, first you have a, a heifer. A heifer is, an animal, is, is a cow who hasn't given birth yet, right? It hasn't. Okay, you have a heifer. She gives birth. It's the first one. I'm going to give it to the Lord. There's no guarantee, no guarantee that that cow will ever give birth again. There are some cows that only one time they give birth, and that's it. Those, they send them to the market, pobrecitas. You don't say pobrecita when you're eating that burger, but anyway, all right, pobrecita. All right. That, <laughs> there's no guarantee that that cow will live that, the rest of that year. Coyotes could come and get that cow. Or it could pick up some disease and die. And so it's a huge step of faith to say, God, this is the firstborn. I'm going to give it to you because I'm going to trust you. I'm going to put my faith in you, right? This is why the firstborn is such a big thing. And then, you know, it says the best portions. Some, some in, in, in Spanish, it said that lo más gordo, like, like, like the fattest one, like, the, like the, ooh, that, oh, look at that chunky lamb right there. It's going to be some good lamb chops, right? It wasn't like, you know, broken ear, crooked tail, limping, and the nickname for that is Lucky. Come here, Lucky. Let's, let's give God Lucky. Like, no. Right? Does anyone here in this service make birria? Anyone here make birria out of goat? Or just, see, okay, I have that mana back there. All right. Don't let me lie on what I'm about to say. So in some of the other services, I ask, how much does a goat or right here a lamb cost today to make birria? Minimum $150. $150. I said $150 last service, and, and the hermano went like this to me. And so someone was like, $250, Pastor. And the hermano looked at me, and he's like, he told me that he said that he had paid $450 for a lamb. Of course, I'm sure that that was best portions lamb, right? The $150 is lucky, right? <laughs> you know? Survive the pit bull attack, has the crooked ear, and let's use that for the birria, right? If you don't know what birria is, don't worry about it. It's just, it's just like a, kind of like a lamb stew, right? You know, special red meat, try, try, try some be, uh, uh, quesabirias, man, oof. Anyways, 150 bucks, minimum, 150 bucks, that's a lot of money. You don't think $150 is a lot of money? Come right now, give it to Pastor Ruben so I can take my wife and my daughters out to eat after church. Notice how everybody laughed, but nobody jumped up to do it. Please, after service, don't come. Pastor, here's money. Take your wife out. No, please. It's just, a, I'm, just I'm just showing that 150 bucks, 250, 350, 450 is a lot of money. And, and this is what Abel presented before the Lord. He brought the best portions, firstborn. Notice lambs, plural, from his flock. And then what happened? Well, God says, I like Abel's, but Cain, there's no adjectives for yours. I don't know if that's what God said, but he, what I do know is that God rejected. Look at verse 5. But he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. In Spanish, I will tell you, tenía la cara larga. He had a long face, right? He had cow face. Verse 6. Why are you so angry, the Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? Seven, you will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. I don't know if I read this or I heard a preacher say that this description is kind of like sin is like a predator, like an animal waiting, crouching. And when you, least, when you drop your guard, jumps on you. Jesus says that, that the devil is like a roaring lion looking for who to devour. But you should subdue it and master it. Verse 8. <coughs> One day Cain suggested to his brother, let's go out into the fields. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel. And, and what did he do? Killed him. Nine. Afterwards, the Lord asked Cain, where is your brother? Where is Abel? I do not know, Cain responded. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's guardian? 10. But the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. I'll say it again. Money is spiritual. Such a spiritual matter that two brothers got into it and one brother killed his own flesh and blood. Let's go to Job 42. 
Job 42, Job is the book right before Psalms. And Job is actually the oldest book in the Bible is written before Genesis. Job 42 is the last chapter of the oldest book in the Bible. I don't know how many people here know the story of Job. <coughs> but the story of Job is that um, Job's a good man. He's a righteous man. And one day the devil comes before the Lord and he says, and the, and the Lord tells Job, have you ever seen my son? Have you ever seen my servant, Job? He's, he's a righteous man. And uh, the devil tells the Lord, he goes, yeah, he's righteous because you've got a hedge of fire around him. You don't let me touch him. But you let me touch him, let me touch him, and I promise you, he'll curse you. And God's like, no, that, that's not going to happen. And so God says, you can touch him, just don't touch, you just cannot take his life. Job had beautiful children. He's rich, he's richy rich Job. Right? He had good health. And suddenly affliction comes. He loses his family, loses his children. He loses his health. He loses his riches. Now, every year I read Job, and I'm going to tell you something. Maybe a lot of pastors, they're not as honest as yours, but I'm going to tell you something. Job is a very hard book to understand. Sometimes I read it, I don't know what I'm reading. I'm like, I don't understand this. Like if you were new to church, pastor, I want to read the Bible. Where should I start? I would never tell you. You should start with Job. Shh transformative. I mean, it's just going to mind blowing. Like, no, it's pretty tough. And I was with my nephews. We're on this challenge. We're trying to read the Bible like in three or four or five months, definitely less than six months. And one of my nephews brought up and he showed me like a, a teaching of a famous pastor passed away. He lived in New York named Timothy Keller. And Timothy Keller says that what's beautiful about Job is that everything that Job says are prayers. And it's like good or bad, right or wrong, whatever he says is prayers. And so everything he says is good because he never lost faith. He constantly maintained communication with God. He was constantly dealing with God, putting his petitions before the Lord. Well, at the very end, Job is restored. And I want you to see how Job is restored. Job 42 verse 10 says, And when Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored. What did the Lord restore? His what? The Lord restored his fortunes. In fact, the Lord gave him twice as much as before, 11. Then all his brothers, sisters, former friends came and feasted with him in his home. And they consoled him and comforted him because of all the trials the Lord had brought against him. Each of them brought him a gift. A gift of what? Let's read the Bible together. Each of them brought the gift of, a gift of what? Of money and of a plastic ring. No, it doesn't say plastic ring. It says a gold ring, right? They didn't go to Walmart, put the quarter, crack, 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 crack. Oh, here you go, Spider-Man. No. They gave him money and a gold ring. All, all of his friends, all of his siblings brought him money and a gold ring. Verse 12 says, So the Lord blessed Job in the second half of his life even more than in the beginning. For now he had 14,000 sheep. What did we say? 150 to $450 a pop? 6,000 camels. I don't know how much a camel costs, but geez, right? A thousand teams of oxen and 1,000 female donkeys. Wow. Okay. 13. He also gave Job seven more sons and three more daughters. Last night, I touched on this verse. My wife was sitting in the front, as she is right now, and I told her, look, babe, Job had 10. We're, we're not even halfway there. She said, No. Even though I said, no hay quinto malo, but she said, no, okay. How, how was Job, Job was blessed, Job was restored. How was he restored? How was he blessed? He was restored and blessed with what? Let's just narrow it down to one word, with what? Money, because of fortune, uh, riches, because all those camels and sheep and, and female donkeys, and at the end of the day, they all represent what? They represent money. Now, I'm going to tell you that the gospel of Jesus Christ came to my family five generations ago with my great-great-grandfather, Jose Alonso. Jose Alonso and other family members were working here in Kima, Texas. They were building a bridge. And it was a camp of workers and um, vast majority minority workers. And some missionaries came, put up a tent, started having services, preaching to the workers. And Jose Alonso 
He liked to observe. He liked to look out the window and look at these people, and he thought they were nutty. He thought they were weird, like I mentioned earlier. He thought they were crazy. He like, look at them. And um, his wife decides that she's going to go to service, and so his wife and one of his daughters go to service. Love it. The Lord touches them. Come back, and they're like, Jose, you need to go to church with us. I mean, I ain't going to church. You need to go to church. He goes, parecen locos. They look like they're crazy. He goes, it looks like they're making tortillas, all that with their hands, you know, the, they were clapping, worshiping. He's like, parecen que andan masando tortillas. Well, they convinced him. He goes and he has an encounter with the Lord. He's filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized with the Holy Spirit. It was so powerful that they had to carry him home. And these were the famous words in our family as he said these words. He said, esta locura si me gusta. This crazy, I like it, right? That's what he said. He's like, I like this crazy. And boom. Fire began in our family. Now, Jose Alonso had a lot of kids, and his kids had a lot of kids, and they were workers, hard workers. And like many of, maybe families of yours, they owned terrenos back in Mexico. And they had like a little restaurant here in the States and where like all the migrant workers would show up and buy breakfast, tacos, and you know, food, whatever, menudo, I don't know what they sold. But there was a, a mentality in those days where, hey, money is bad. If, if you're a Christian, if you're holy, money is unholy. And so they began to just let things go and get rid of things because they thought being poor is holy. Being poor, it shows that you're right with God and money corrupts, right? And so, and people would rip them off and they were just like, we're going to live in peace. And they just let everything go. And that was one extreme. And back in the 90s and 2000s, the pendulum swung to another extreme to what many call the prosperity gospel. Now, I believe in prosperity and I believe in the gospel, but I don't believe in the prosperity gospel, name it and claim it, and you can have anything you want, and you give $1,000 to this ministry, and God's going to multiply by 100, and, you know, all these crazy and wacky things, and that, you know, you should have a big house. God, you're the child of a king, so you should have a big house, and you should have a car for every day in the week, and, you know, like all these crazy, wacky things, like, gee. The truth, the truth is somewhere in the middle. As we see here that God blessed Job, blessed Job with money, but money isn't the only blessing. God blessed Job with money, but money isn't the only blessing. He also blessed him with kids. And he also blessed him with what? With good health. And I'm going to tell you that there are things that are more important than money. I was trying to remember last night, and I finally remembered this morning, and my brother and my dad were here uh, to confirm last service. But a couple of years ago, my brother, my dad, and I, on a very rare occasion, we went together on a road trip. We went to go by a radio station in the valley, 840 AM, out in Brownsville area, McAllen area. Uh, and when we were coming home, we stopped in this little town. And uh, for you millenniums, and what's the, what's the, what's the generation after millenniums? Um, Gen Z, and then now there's one after Gen Z. I think it's Gen Alpha. And so for you millenniums, Gen Z and Gen Alpha that might be here, you might not know what I'm, gonna, what I'm going to, um, uh, uh, what I'm talking about, but there were these boxes and you would put like money, a coin, a quarter. I don't, probably don't even know what that is. You're like, is that Apple Pay, Pastor? No, it's not. And you would open this machine and get what was called in those days a newspaper, all right? Google image it, a newspaper, right? Well, at this restaurant, they, they happened to have, it was like a free thing. So you didn't have to put a quarter. So my brother opens it, or my dad, I don't know. And one of them got this article, and they started reading it. And, and there was an article, like a story, an essay written by, by, uh, by a man from that region, or as we say in Spanish, de esa región. Um, he, was, he was a black man, a black gentleman. And he said, he claimed, this black gentleman claimed that he was the richest man in the region that he was a multi, multi-millionaire. I want, I want to know about that cat, right? So my brother starts, or my dad starts, I don't remember who it was, but they start reading this story, and, and he said that he was like 78 years old, and every day he walked two miles, walked and came back, and, and, and he was, still had energy for the rest of the day. And he goes, I'm the richest man in the region. I'm, I'm a multi-millionaire. And he's like, my wife loves me so much. She cooks me breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and makes what I want to eat. I'm the richest man in the region. I'm a multi-multi-millionaire. My kids are the most beautiful kids in the region. Everybody's envious because 
because of how beautiful my kids are. I'm the richest man in the, in the, in the, in the region, a multi, multi-millionaire. I still have friends and family and siblings who love me and care about me, who call and check up on me. Man, he talked about all this stuff. You know what he didn't talk about? He didn't talk about Bitcoin. He didn't talk about his credit score. He did not talk about the dollars that he has in the bank. Instead, he talked about other things that as well are important and have value. Money is important. We have obligations to take care of our families. We have obligations to take care of our families and to support the kingdom of God that the gospel will continue to be preached. Salvation is free, but it costs to preach the gospel, but it's not the most important thing. Money is a blessing, but it's not the only blessing. You live in Houston, Texas, and you may not know this, but there's what we call the medical center. And in the medical center, we have MD Anderson, which is one of the best hospitals, cancer treatment hospitals in the world. People from all over the world fly into Houston to go to be treated at MD Anderson. The richest people in the world come to Houston to be treated at MD Anderson. And let me tell you that there are people there that are multi, multi, multi millionaires that have tens of millions, maybe even hundreds of millions of dollars who would say, I would give it all to walk out of here totally healed. So money is a blessing, but it's not the most important blessing. The most important blessing is salvation through Jesus Christ, right? Because when you and I die, and sooner or later we will die, everything, every penny will be left here on this earth. But salvation, and I think that, uh, that more important than money is not only salvation, but it's unity in the family. I mean, what, what use is it to, to have a miserable marriage or to have kids that hate you? Or to not be able to pick up the phone at 3 a.m. and call a good friend who can listen to you vent or that would come and help you change a flat tire. So money's important, money's a blessing, but it's not the most important and it's not the only blessing. Now I want you to go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And then we're going to finish from 1 Timothy chapter 6. We are going to finish in Proverbs chapter 3. Now, money is spiritual, money is a blessing, but money can be dangerous. Money, resources, riches can be dangerous. And it becomes dangerous when we have this mentality, more, 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 I want, somebody help me, more. More, 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 I want more more. And so 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 says, yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. Verse 7, after all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. 9. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. 10. For money is the root of all kinds of evil. No, that's not what it says. It says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some Bibles say, for the love of money is the root of all evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. How much is enough? How much is enough? I'm going to share with you, and and let me tell you, before I even continue, I'm going to say, hey, I'm all for having a nice house. I want a nicer house. I'm all for having a nice house. I'm all for you having a nice car, new cars. I've owned several new cars throughout my lifetime. I'm all for you going on vacation to Bora Bora. Grace. Guanajuato, Mexico. I'm all for that. I'm all for that, right? But how much is enough? How much is enough? Your family of three and and you're working overtime and double overtime, triple overtime to pay for a six-bedroom house. You have two cars, two trucks, motorcycle, 
You have a car for every day of the week, and you're single? I mean, like, at one point, how much is enough? And so, like, we have to, this is what we need to deal with and wrestle with, right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you um, a few questions. A question, I'm asking myself these questions. I'm not just, I'm ask, we're going to ask some questions this afternoon. That I want you, at the end, I want you to take a picture because I want you to really think about this stuff. First of all, do I prioritize money over God, family, friends, and health? Right, that's the first question. Do I prioritize money over God, faith, family, friends, and health? I mean, how, how many people are working overtime, double overtime, triple overtime? And I know, I know that sometimes work demands certain things from us, and, but like all the time. All the time, working double time, double overtime, triple overtime, all the time. So much so that you've never seen Junior play baseball because you're too busy working. So much so that your marriage is like on the brinks, and you think, well, if I buy her another bracelet, I buy her, you know, some something from Tiffany and Co. You know, therefore I have to work more so that I can afford this, and that's going to fix things. Like, Hey, I haven't, seen, I haven't seen Johnny at church. I asked the wife, and the wife is like, oh, well, it's because, you know, he's been working. Oh, okay, he's working double overtime. Oh, that's nice. A month later, hey, I still haven't seen Johnny at church. Well, you know, he's still working. Still, you know, three months later, well, he's still working. But pastor, we're getting really good checks. Yeah, but I haven't seen you bring your kids to church. Do I prioritize money over God, family, friends, health? How many people are sick, sick? with anxiety, with depression, with so much stress, back pains, so much stress because we've got to pay that house note, got to pay that college um, debt, we have to pay this car, we have to pay that. When maybe, when maybe if we would step from a six bedroom with four baths house back to a four bedroom with three baths house and you live perfectly fine in it, same way. Maybe if, if we could just go down from like, you know, like, you know, go from like a Lexus to a Toyota, from a Rolex to a Timex? From an iPhone to a Samsung? Oh, don't go there, Pastor. Okay, I'm not gonna, we won't go there. You, you can keep your iPhone. <laughs> but maybe, maybe if we just took a, a step back and, and, and lived a little bit slightly simpler life, we could spend more time with the Lord, spend more time with our spouse, spend more time with our kids, and recuperate our health. Do I prioritize money over God, family, friends, and health? Number two, am I bothered when someone earns more, possesses more, or achieves more? Am I bothered about this? Right. Hey, did you see the primo? He just posted that he got a new truck. Yeah, man, you know what? That's kind of weird. He got a new truck, got a new house, lives down there in the valley. For sure he's dealing drugs, for sure. You bothered when your coworker gets uh, promoted to manager or supervisor, general foreman. You've been there working longer, and now he's making a little bit more. Uh, ever since he got that promotion, he, he thinks he, he thinks he's big poop. I was gonna say something else. I almost slipped, right? <laughs> he thinks he's the big dog. He thinks like, oh, he like, look at him. He's all he's all conceited now. He's, he's like the same person. He has no idea what you're talking about. But part of his job is to tell you what to do and it bothers you. Am I bothered when someone earns more, possesses more, or achieves more? La prima post that she's in Cancun. Cancun, mm, well, you know, next year we're going to Greece. Why, why can't you just say, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Praise the Lord, hallelujah, for my coworker, man. He got a promotion. He, I hope he's a great manager. I hope he shows me mercy when I show up late, <laughs> right? You know? Why couldn't you say, like, praise the Lord, hallelujah, when the primo got the truck? Like, why, why couldn't you say that? Why did you have to say, yeah, but he got a base model, and when I got mine, I got, like, the top of the line. Why, why do you have to say that? Why couldn't you just say, praise the Lord, man, I'm, I'm happy for my primo, right? Number three, do I compare my financial status to others and feel envious or inadequate? Like you feel weird because someone has a Nike. You thought you were all cool. You know, you're coming to church with brand new Nikes. You thought, and then somebody walked in with Versace shoes and you're like, oh, right now you're embarrassed, right? Like, I mean, like you, you feel envious or inadequate because of someone else has, has a little bit more, right? You ordered a medium, they got a large, and you, you, now you're like, there's this weird dynamic, a little bit envious, you know, or, or these type of things. You bothered, I shared this last service, 
you're bothered because la sobrina had a big, beautiful wedding and everybody was happy and excited and you're bothered because yours ate la torta. Some of you are like, what does that mean? Like, yours got pregnant and, they, and then didn't get married. And so you're bothered by the... Or you're bothered that your niece graduated from the university and, and your kid dropped out of high school and, and that like bothers you, rubs you sort of, you know, and, and instead of just being, man, gloria a Dios, praise the Lord for, for my sobrina. I'm so proud of her. You know, like instead of having that, feeling that, you know, there's a, there's a little piece, there's a little part in you, kind of like a voodoo doll, like someone got a little needle and beep, poked you and you just kind of like, like, oh yeah, oh, congratulations, mija. All right, let's move on. Another question. I'm tired of picking on y'all. How do I use my money? How do I use my money? How do I use my, am I responsible? Am I irresponsible? Do I know? I don't know. I have no idea. How do I use my money? If we were to see your financial statement, your credit card statement, your debit card statement, what does it say about you? What does it say about me? How do I use my money? Am I okay with sowing in the kingdom? Am I okay when the Lord puts in my heart, hey, give extra, give more? Am I okay with being obedient to that? Am I okay when I, when I see a widow, an orphan, an immigrant, or a poor, and all of a sudden I feel that tell, like, man, I should help them out, and instead I say, okay, I didn't trabajo, let them go work. I'll work hard for mine. I, I, I'm just asking questions. How do I use my money? Here's the fifth one, all right? Am I content, right, take a picture of this. Am I content, how much am I worth if I were to lose all my money? <laughs> you know what, I kid you not, 8 a.m. service, ask this question. How much am I worth if I were to lose all my money? And someone on my right hand said, nothing. I was like, I feel sorry for you, I'm praying for you. About <laughs> to go bankrupt. The government came and took everything I owned. You know what, I'd be like that man I told y'all about. I'd still be a millionaire, I'd still be rich. I have a wife who loves me. I have kids who adore me. I have friends that I can call at 3 a.m. anytime for anything, for any reason. Right? I have Jesus in my heart. I have the peace that surpasses all understanding in my life. I have nephews and nieces who, who love me. I mean, like, how much would I be? I'm sure, I, I would still say I'm rich. Sometimes Naily will tell you, I'm carrying Chalina on my left, the baby. And Ruth comes and she's sitting on my lap and right. Rebecca's laying, you know, with her next to me, laying down next to me. Raquel comes and leans, you know, lays on the sofa behind me. And I'll tell my wife, take a picture, take a picture, because I'm a multi, multi, multi millionaire. Okay. Am I content? Am I content with a Toyota instead of a Lexus? Am I content with a Timex instead of a Rolex? Am I content with, you know, the vacaciones? We're going to San Antonio to Six Flags. Even though the prima went to Bora Bora. Right? Now, I'm not saying for you to not have any of these things, but I mean, if we can't afford it, we can't afford it. Let's just be honest. Right? Let's be content and let's be happy for those that, that, that are going out there and doing whatever. Right? Yes or no? Okay, Proverbs chapter 3. All right. Proverbs chapter 3, and this is, this is going to be... Uh, a really important verse, and this verse, which I shared it often in the months of December and January, and then I'm going to share with you four truths about money, and then we're going to pray together. But Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Then you will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. All right, back to verse 9. Verse 9, honor the Lord with your wealth and the best part of everything you produce. Are we honoring the Lord with our wealth? Are we honoring the Lord with the best of everything we produce? Remember what I told you, live by this. Give God what is first and what is best. Right? Honor the Lord with what is first and what is best. Okay. Uh, we're going to finish off this afternoon with um, four truths about money. First thing, first thing I wanna share with you is that money is a tool, right? 
Money is a tool. Now think of a hammer. A hammer can be used to build up, to construct, but a hammer can also be used to destroy, right? To deconstruct. Think of a saw. A saw could be used to build, to help build a house, but it can also be used to help tear down a house. Money is a tool, a gun, a gun is a tool. I mean, you know, we had a gun and we just put it right there. It was not gonna do anything, but it could be used for good or it could be used for bad. Money is a tool, how are you using this tool? Are you using it for good or using it for bad? Money is a tool, right? Second truth about money is that money is a blessing. Don't let it become a curse. See, God turns curses into blessings. The enemy turns blessings into curse. And for some people, more than what you need can suddenly become a curse instead of a blessing. So many people, oh, if I, Pastor, if I just win the lotto, I mean, that's all I'm asking for. I'm praying. If I just win the lotto, I'll give my tithes. I'll, I'll build a new church. That's, that's bunk. That's not true. That's false. You're lying to yourself. If right now you make $800 a week and you can't make a check for $80, which is your tithe, you think if you were to win $100 million that you would be able to make a check for $10 million? Nah. Your hand would start shaking. $10 million, that's a lot of money. Money is a blessing. I just realized that or in last service I said $1 million, which would be 1% of $100 million. But uh, anyways, 10% of $100 million is $10 million. Money's a blessing, don't let it become a curse. Don't let the enemy turn it into a curse in your life. More, 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 and I want what? I want more, it's dangerous. Number three, money belongs to God. Everything belongs to God. All the gold, all the silver, all the precious stones, everything belongs to God. There's a verse in, in Colossians that I love, it says, speaking of Jesus, everything was created by him for him. At the end of the day, it all belongs to God. You and I, we are just administrators, right? How are we administrating what God has put in our hands? God gives us some guidelines. Hey, give me your tithes, give me your offering. Stay out of debt. Don't forget about the widow, the poor, the immigrant, the orphan. Don't forget about the kingdom. There's some guidelines. And what, what, at the end of the day, we need to realize, hey, it all belongs to God. That, that's, why, that's why today's message is not my money, but God's. All right, number four. Money is a mirror. All right, take a picture of this. Money is a mirror. Money is a tool. Money is a blessing. Money belongs to God. Money is a mirror. What does money reflect about you? What does money reflect? What does... What does your ways of trying to achieve more money, get more money, what does it reflect about you? What does it reflect about me? Now, I will tell you that sometimes it reflects the best in us, but sometimes it reflects the worst in us. It could reflect the best in us, but it can also reflect the worst in us. I mean, Cain killed his own brother. Ju um, Judas was a, a disciple with Jesus and he sold him out for some silver. What does money reflect about you? What does money reflect about me? Okay. As we prepare to land this plane, I'm, I'm going to have a confession to make to you. And I'm going to repent this afternoon, right? I'm going to be the first to confess and the first to repent that I have not always used money as a tool to edify. I have let in times in my life money to become a curse instead of a blessing. I have not always been a good administrator of God's money and there are times that money would reflect of me, the worst of me, instead of the best of me. I'm the first to admit this. I'm the first to repent from this. I'm the first to confess this publicly before all of you in social media. Is there anyone else that this afternoon would raise their hand and say, Pastor, I'm there with you? 
Let's close our Bibles. Let's bow our heads. I want to encourage you to just, first of all, just start thanking God that you came to church today. Say, Father, thank you that I came to church. Thank you, Lord, that I made it. Thank the Lord for his word. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you, Lord. If you haven't used money as a tool to build up, to edify, to be a blessing to others, would you say today, would you pray right there where you're at and say, Father, forgive me for not using money as a tool to build up, to edify? If in occasions in your life, money has been a cursing instead of a blessing, would you put that before the Lord in this moment? Would you say, Father, forgive me. Forgive me when I've allowed money or the pursuit of more money or where I've allowed possessions or riches or treasures or the, pos the pursuit of more possessions, riches and treasures to be transformed into a cursing instead of a blessing? Can you put before the Lord today and say, you know what, Father, I have not been a good administrator of what really belongs to you. The way I pursue money, the way I deal with my money, does not good, give a good reflection about you. And worse, it doesn't give a good reflection about me. Or just as bad, it, do, it gives, does money has not given a good reflection about me when I look in the mirror. I'm ashamed of the person that I'm looking at because of how I deal with money or the pursuit of money. Let me pray for you, Pueblo Church. Father God, I, I, with my brothers and sisters, we come before you seeking your forgiveness as we repent and we confess these things that we know are not right before your eyes. We put them before you. We seek your forgiveness. We seek your restoration. We seek your wisdom and knowledge that you would guide us, that we would honor you with what really belongs to you. Not my money, but God's. In Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus, amen, amen, amen. Let's give the Lord some praise this afternoon.